All right, welcome, Heart of the Matter from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm your host, Sean McCraney. I was just told I look like Joe Biden wearing these. I have no idea what Joe Biden or anyone else wears. I just uh, have those prescription lenses and have to wear them to see a distance. Anyway, this is the long show. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for life. You're loving us so much. You gave us your son that we seek him in spirit and truth. Grateful for your spirit, which uh, illuminates and teaches us all things. We pray that you'll be with Kathy Maggs as she re, uh, records this and gets this out for people to watch in the future and in the archives and from the show uh, tonight. So, Lord, we just pray that you'll give us the truth and that eyes and ears may open to your truth and your truth alone. In Jesus' name, amen. I emphasize that in the prayer because the name of the show tonight is you can't see because you won't open your eyes, right? Your eyes are squint shut, and how can you see anything if you are shutting them? So once again, my gratitude to Brother Kel uh, for his online stuff that he uh, provides me in an area from which I'm going to borrow. I'm going to present to you a super simple scripturally straightforward teaching tonight that I'd like you to consider. And I'm going to use scripture to explain it. Uh, specifically, I will appeal to the very words of God cited herein. Now, some of you are, are automatically opposed to me. So you've already shut your ears and eyes and you're ready for defense. You think I'm coming to you to fight you. And so you've already built up defenses ready to, to fight. That's what you're doing. You're sitting there ready to fight and show how I'm wrong. Uh, I may be wrong. That's okay. I'm not saying don't question me, but I am saying uh, test all things, consider what I have to say, and kind of back off from your defensive position. Just try to hear, all right? So I'm going to use scripture to, spy, uh, to explain what God himself says. And when I say from God himself, what do you think of? If I say to you, God himself says this, what do you think of in your mind? What do you see when I say, I'm going to quote from God himself? Ask yourself that open-ended question. Only you know the answer to. Do you see a single being called God? White robe, you know, long gray hair, beard. Do you see something like that? Or uh, who, who scripture calls the father? Is that who you see as God? Or when I say, when God speaks in the Old Testament, do you see three separate beings speaking from one mouth? I don't know how that works, but what do you see? The, what you see tells you a lot about what you believe. So first ask yourself, what do you see? Honestly answer before we move on. All right. So, um, then how do you see passages that say things like, Paul says, a passage I love to use, for though there be many gods, lowercase, whether in heaven and earth, there be gods many and lords many, lowercase g, lowercase l, though there be many, he says, but to us there's but one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. So Paul there says there's one God, the Father. That's what Paul says. So we're citing the Old Testament where it says, God says, and I said, I'm going to cite God, Yahweh says, and I said, what do you see in your mind's eye? And now we have Paul saying, hey, listen, uh, though there be many gods and many lords, lowercase, he says, but to us, there's but one God, uppercase G, the Father. That's what he says. And one Lord, uppercase L, the Lord Jesus Christ. Fortunately, there are quite a few passages in the Old Testament where the one God who we've been talking about, uh, who Paul says is the Father, says things like, I am God and there is no other. And says things like, I am God, I know of no other. Meaning, I know of none other like me. And, and the Lord, our God is one. In other words, God himself says, I'm it, no others from the mouth of that one God. He says, I'm it. There are no others who is speaking. When we read these passages again, in your mind, who do you see as speaking out the three with one common mouth? I am God. Is that what you see? Or do you see one God, the father, like Paul says, saying this Yahweh, right? One. And when he says it, 
the father, to, to us, the father, when he says that, he says, I don't know of any other gods. Do you see that happening? Our Trinitarian friends, you may be one of them, automatically, when talking about God speaking, Old Testament or New Testament, who we all agree is unchangeable and and forever three persons in one being, um, say the mouthpiece is the mouth of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what they say. That is God speaking, okay? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because that's the way they have been trained and taught to see the one God, that these are persons, three persons in one being, and that is the one speaking in the Old Testament. Did you know that? That every time in the Old Testament, it speaks of Yahweh, it speaks of God, the one God, a Trinitarian must, in order to be consistent, identify the speaker as three. Has to. Can't, to be logical and consistent, cannot see one God with one mouth speaking as a person. Has to see three persons with a mouth, so to speak, speaking. Okay? Now, and, and that's, that's possible. I can see how that can happen. But we have a problem. If the one speaking is a member of the three person trinity, if the Holy Sp- uh, spoke, the, ho- the Holy Smoke, if the Holy Ghost is speaking and he says, or it says, I am God and there is none other, then we have a problem with him speaking relative to the Father and the Son. If the son says, I am God, and there is no other, I don't know of any other, and he says, I am, and he's a person, in the Trinity, we have a problem with the existence of a person, father, and a person, spirit. You get it? So there's a problem when in the Old Testament, Yahweh says, I am God, there is no other. The problem is the speaker person who is saying it automatically uh, denigrates the existence of the others, all right? So, in other words, the son person of the Trinity can't say, I am God and there's no others because he would eliminate the Father and the, and the Holy Spirit being able to say, I am God and there is no others. So Trinitarians must say that when Yahweh speaks in the Old Testament, It's the three persons of the one being talking, and they say that is God only. So the Trinitarian has to say, when God speaks, it is Father, Son, Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but those collectively have one mouth, and that one mouth, when it says, I am God, is the one doing the talking. Because Jesus said to know the only true living God and his son whom he has sent, I'm paraphrasing, is life eternal. I spend time talking about this because I believe we have been collectively misled as to who he is, the one God who's speaking in the Old Testament, all right? Now, if you have eyes to see, I really believe this, and ears that are at least willing to try to hear and to seek and test everything I say, um, know this, the Bible clearly tells us who is speaking in the Old Testament when God says, I am God and there is none else. I am God and I know no, no other, okay? Let's look at one of those passages. Uh, and I said, I'm going to simply use scripture and I'm going to use a few simple scriptures that you can listen to and look at. Test it. In Joel 2.27, God says, I am the Yahweh, your God, and no one else. Meaning I don't know of any other. I am Yahweh, your God. Again, what do you see? What do you imagine? What do you, what do you worship? What do you think? Who is that? Okay. Here the speaker says, I am Yahweh your God. And he says, he excludes all others. There's none other. Again, 
Trinitarians must say the one saying that is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But I want to show you, prove to you, that the one speaking is the Father. And that is consistent then with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8. That there is to us but one God, the Father. I want to prove to you that in the Old Testament, the one speaking is the Father. You see, what God says here is his own personal testimony, witness of himself. Who he is and who he is not. Right? He says, I am God. I'm God. And there's none else. Okay? He's giving you a witness of himself. And if he says that, we know that scripture proves scripture. And so we must have validation somewhere that tells us that the one who says this in Joel is the father. It's not just because I read that and I think it's the father. I can't just make that jump. I have to have proof that the one speaking in Joel is the father. Okay. So I want to prove that to you now. How do we know that this is only the true and living God, the Father who is speaking here, and not the man-made Trinity harmonizing their message so that it will make sense for them? How do we know? If I can prove to you that the speaker is God the Father alone uh, at Joel 2.27, which we just read, Would you open your mind? Would you be willing to see and hear a new way to understand God? Or are you going to cling to what you've been taught? In Luke 24, 49, Jesus has been raised from the dead. And there he gives his instructions to his disciples. Now, this is the last chapter of Luke. And he says, and behold, I send the promise of my father the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. All right. We know that he's talking about the Holy Spirit there and that this is coming to them at Pentecost because we know the story. Very plain. So the key words are when Jesus says, I send to his disciples the promise of my Father upon you. The Father, His Father, made a promise somewhere. And Jesus says He's going to send that promise that the Father made upon them. And He says, stay in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of my Father, which I will send and will empower you from on high. This was written again at the end of Luke's gospel. Now we go to Luke's Acts. Luke was the writer of Acts. And now Luke, the historian, the doctor, he writes the book of Acts. And the first chapter opens up with essentially the same message in chapter 1, verses 4 through 5 and 8. So listen. And Luke writes in Acts, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which... He said, you have heard of me. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. uh, Luke, he takes his gospel and he ends it. And then he sort of rewrites or repeats what he ended his gospel with. And he brings us now to the day of Pentecost, 50 days later. But wait for the promise of my father, which he has heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. And then in verse 8, he says, but you shall receive power that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So again, we are told what was received as the promise of the Father, what it was. It was the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit. That's the promise of the Father. Acts 2.33, a very important scripture. Has Peter tell the Jews who are also there at Pentecost about the promise of this father and how it was given to Jesus too. Okay, so listen to Acts 2.33. Peter says, therefore, speaking of Jesus, being at the right hand of God exalted, Jesus being at the right hand of God exalted, 
And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus also received, having received, Peter says, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. He has shed forth this, meaning Jesus has now shed forth this Holy Spirit, which you now see and hear. Peter is describing, listen, what you're seeing here, these guys aren't drunk. This is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, who is at the right hand of his Father, also received the promise of the Spirit from his Father. Isn't that remarkable? The promise came to Jesus first, and then he, Jesus distributes it to his disciples. So what we learn here is Jesus is pouring out the promise of his Father on the day of Pentecost because he, too, received the promise of his Father, which again was the Holy Spirit. The Father, Yahweh, made the promise, and Jesus, having overcome sin and death, is the one who then baptizes people with that promise of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't baptize them with the promise of the Holy Spirit. He baptizes them with the Holy Spirit. All right? That's why John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize with water, but the one who's coming is mightier and I. I'm not even worthy to tie his darn shoe. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's the baptisms Christians are looking for, right? Right? That's the spiritual baptism that comes upon Christians. The one that the Father promised and the one that Jesus received and then Jesus gives. He's the one who baptizes with this power. So, um, bottom line, the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. Again, the promise of the Father, of the Father, is the Holy Spirit. Jesus received this promise, Acts 2.33, and then rising victoriously from the dead, poured the promise of his Father out upon his disciples and all others who received him by faith. Listen to Acts 2.33 again, where Peter said to those Jews, therefore, Jesus being at the right hand of God, now exalted, and having received the the having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this, the Holy Spirit, upon us now, which you see and hear. That's what's going on, Peter says. So the question, where in Scripture do we ever find God the Father? Remember, it's the promise of God the Father Where do we find God the Father making this promise to send the Holy Spirit? Well, Peter tells us where we can find it. Remember? It's right there on the same day. He's standing there in front of 3,000 Jews on the day of Pentecost, and this is what Peter says. Are your ears and eyes willing to hear and see? I pray the Spirit will move you, not me. I pray that you will not be uh, charmed by my, my magnificent beard or my fantastic ponytail. But I I pray you will be moved by the Spirit to understand this with spiritual eyes and ears. This is what Peter said on the day of Pentecost to those Jews who are wondering, what is going on here? But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, Peter said back then, the last days of that age, saith God, saith God. What God do you think of? Peter says, God said this uh, back in Joel, that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's the promise of Yahweh, the promise of the Father, who is God. Like Paul says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. There's the promise of God the Father again, as Peter cites from Joel, and they shall prophesy. And he goes on and says, all those who call on the name of the Lord would be saved. We know 
that the promise of the Father was that he would pour out his spirit. Therefore, we know when Peter says that God said, I will pour out my spirit, it means the Father alone because it's the promise of the Father. So God the Father, when he says, I am God and there is none other, that is God the Father and that is who God is. That is who God is, guys. From him came his word that became flesh in the man Jesus. From him comes his spirit, his pneuma, that gives life. From the one God. You have to understand that if you want to know him, because to know him is life eternal and his son, Jesus Christ. That's why Paul wrote, but to us, there's but one God, comma, the father, comma. And then he adds, and then there's one Lord Jesus Christ. The Trinitarians do not get that. They don't agree with that. They don't see it because of the traditions of men. And they have been taught as children or as converts what this one God looks like, and they've created this thing. But it goes contrary to what the scripture plainly says. The Father made this promise through Joel. Pentecost is the fulfillment of the promise of God the Father. All right? So we know that it was God the Father who made the promise, and now we know where God the Father made that promise in the book of Joel. And that Peter cites the book of Joel, and he says at the day of Pentecost, and he says that God said, so we know it's the Father. And then all of it makes sense. Now listen up to what Joel says. I want to wrap it up with this. You shall know that I'm in the in Joel. We'll start with Joel 2.27, which is what we started this off with. And you shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and that I am Yahweh, your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Who is that? That's the Father. How do we know that? Listen. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old man shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Peter says, that's how happening now. God the Father, the only God of which he knows no other, said in Joel, I will pour out my spirit. And Peter stands before that crowd and says, that's what's happening now. In these last days, where there's going to be a terrible day of the Lord coming in the next 40 years, God is going to send this to us now. And you're seeing this, you're hearing this Jews around me. Peter cites the Father saying this. Luke tells us that God's uh, father, that the father's promise was being fulfilled in that day. And Joel reports that the father's witness of himself saying, I am Yahweh, your God, and there is none else. The father said these words, not God, the father, not God, the son, not God, the Holy Spirit, the one God, the father from whom the son and the Holy Spirit came. And this one God, the Father, excludes everyone else from his one mouth when he said, I am Yahweh, your God, and there is no other. Don't worship a myth. Don't worship a man-made creation. Worship the one God. Worship the one God. Do you believe his testimony and witness? Do you seek him in spirit and truth? Or are you doing the monkey thing? Ah, ah, ah. I mean, what? I mean, how are you approaching it? I gain nothing. It does nothing for me to know that you in Argentina are hearing this message and you are receiving the truth of it. I'm not bringing you into my church. You, if you're a seeker of truth, are trying to keep your eyes and ears open to truth. Test what I'm saying. Don't believe the traditions. I don't believe that the people who embrace the traditions are in trouble with God. And I believe that they seek him too. But I think they've been maligned like most of us have by religion and by traditions, and they don't see the scripture for what it really says. If you can't see, if you cannot see what I'm sharing with you right now through this example, it, uh, it's because you won't open your eyes. It's, it's simply as that. You just won't do it because you, you refuse for some reason. Uh, 
Seek the straits of his mysteries. He can be found, but it won't be found in the annals of religious history or in the groupthink of religious traditions. Only in his word, by the Spirit, through people seeking to know the truth at whatever cost. See you next week.